So I would like to tell you a little bit of our experience of what we did during the epidemic. Uh, it was actually almost the same as for every one of you, probably tiring, probably demanding. And uh, I hope and I believe that we did whatever possible in this hard situation for us. I need to tell you a little bit about our institution. Uh, our institution is part of the Faculty of Medicine in Ljubljana. It's actually the biggest institute of that faculty. Uh, we have about 160 uh, employees and uh, about 75% of them, they're actually involved in the routine diagnostics of microbiology, all parts of microbiology. The virology is maybe a part with about 30 employees before. We do a lot of uh, exotic diagnostics. Uh, I think uh, many of you uh, know maybe two of our members, which are Professor Tatiana Aushi Jupans, working on all kinds of vector-borne diseases, especially hantaviruses, and Professor Mario Poliak, who is a specialist in uh, human papilloma viruses. So uh, we are uh, actually forming the core of the people who are starting to, to work with the hantaviruses at that time when the epidemic uh, began. So let, let me show you where we are standing just about today. We have performed about 2,000 PCR yesterdays and about 7,000 uh, um, antigenic tests, and we found actually... Um, about, uh, I think, 700 uh, positives uh, just in the previous day. So average positives on the last uh, seven days is 1,700, uh, which for 2 million population is quite high. Also very important uh, data is that we have already 127 ICU uh, booked and uh, our limit for the country is 100. 150. So are uh, swiftly approaching the uh, last level we are able to cope with it. And as you see, we uh, recorded for now 4,693 4, deaths. So I think that we are now in quite bad situation. If you look at this data, which is provided by, uh, by some nonprofit organization, which was established during the epidemic, it's called COVID-9 Tracker or Sledilnik in Slovenian which really try to do everything possible to gather data, data from laboratories, from the hospitals, from any other point available to show whatever possible to track the epidemics better. So you see this green line is uh, showing the total vaccinated people. This is per day, actually. So you see the vaccination is not going well in Slovenia. Uh, we have some tragic moment with the death of a 20 years old uh, girl uh, vaccinated by uh, Janssen. And uh, when we see here, uh, which is actually uh, not very well seen because the scale is distorted due to this big vaccination data, we have now exponential growth of the infection. It gets uh, very much worse in October when students uh, getting back to their duties. Uh, we don't have any hybrid lectures or anything like that. We are fully open now with universities, uh, schools, uh, and kindergartens. So, what is actually the role of the microbiological laboratory in the emerging pathogens? So we all know actually the laboratory medicine is an essential element of the healthcare system. It is integral to many clinical decisions, providing physicians, nurses, and other healthcare providers with often pivotal information for the prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and management of disease. But also, to face the current COVID-19 pandemic, diagnostic tools are essential. It is recommended to use real-time RT-PCR for RNA viruses in order to perform 
rapid and accurate diagnostic to guide patient care management and to guide epidemiological strategies, which uh, shows up as uh, one of the cornerstone how to battle the epidemic. So strategies for identifying SARS-CoV-2 infection on the one hand is identifying epidemiological link, specific clinical picture, which we know could be specific, but also not specific, and specific symptoms like uh, losing the taste or something uh, similar. Uh, then on the laboratory side, we can detect viral RNA, viral proteins, we can isolate the virus, and we can detect a specific antibodies. Uh, thankfully, we could do all these techniques at our institute from maybe early at the beginning. We still believe that method of choice is real-time reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction uh, with a different combination of target genes. Uh, we prefer the methods which uh, takes hours, not days. Uh, it is sensitive sometimes in this uh, epidemic. It shows maybe sometimes too sensitive. Uh, we can elaborate on this later if needed, but there are three major challenges in molecular diagnosis. To detect small amounts of fire RNA for reducing the number of false negatives, I would say this is very important at the beginning of the disease to differentiate the positive signal among different pathogens for decreasing the number of false positive which was not shown as a big problem during this epidemic, and to have a large capacity in order to quickly and correctly test a large number of patients while avoiding false negatives and false positive. I will show you the numbers later, but for our institute, this was just really, uh, uh, to say so, being as a tsunami. Before the epidemic, we test per day around 1,000 to 1,300 samples. 1,300 samples was filled by the staff as really overburdened everything from the receiving department to the lab to process all the samples. Uh, I think that the virology samples never exceed about 60%, maybe more close to 50 or 55% of all the samples we receive at the Institute. During the epidemic, this number actually uh, going like 500% more. So we regularly receive like 4,000 to 5,000 samples per day, which was really overwhelming for all of us, not only for analysis, but also for reception, logistics, and all other problems, which I would try to briefly elaborate. So collection of samples was a big issue. I often, stress that in the time of epidemic, we get a lot of new professionals who are first time dealing with taking samples of nasopharyngeal swab. I would say in Slovenia, this number has actually like 10 times higher than it was before Corona. Before Corona, actually there was very less need to take nasopharyngeal swabs. Uh, they were only taken in children or severely ill patients being headed to the hospital or IC units. They were never done at the primary care. So now actually you can do nasopharyngeal swab around every corner with people who are not trained properly and uh, maybe really not doing a good job. So which can in, uh, influence the quality of results, the satisfaction of the patients, and uh, also some other, uh, other different uh, uh, factors, very important in the final results in the diagnosis. Also what was very new in this epidemic is actually we do uh, need to perform the, the evaluation of an absolutely new test from many manufacturers to get a sense of security. Uh, there was absolutely demand for quick diagnostics, which was uh, actually in opposition. We were short on reagents. I never experienced something like that. Uh, we battle every day to, to secure not only the reagents, but all other um, all other equipment and uh, things we need to provide the, the, the diagnostics. Uh, also, the 
very absolutely problematic thing could be pre-analytic setting with sample transport. We received samples from the whole country, which may take like a whole day. And they bring you in the evening, you would see a pictures, a pile of samples and they demand to be analyzed at once. So this is our setup uh, maybe to uh, show you we receive samples from hospitals, healthcare centers, public testing points established during the epidemic and from businesses which they are in need for testing their employees. So then we need to receive the samples, go to refrigerator, then process in the BSC hood class two, then go to sample preparation. We have here the automated system like a Cobas 6080, Alinity, Starlet from CGIN, Liat and Gene Expert as a very quick uh, method to, to go to high quality results, but doesn't help us a lot because the restriction of reagents uh, was very severe. So we get like, uh, you could not imagine like a 10 or 20 reagents per week. This was like a joke. So we keep them for the night shift for the people who need to really perform during the night, a very quick decision on critically ill patient. And this is like a classical point. We need to equip ourselves with four different uh, actually uh, nucleic acid isolation platforms and where there was a bottleneck was a manual pipetting. Those of you who work in the lab, you would appreciate what it means to uh, pipette manually 384 plate, uh, let's say in 11 p.m. in the evening and do it manually. This was really a nightmare for a while and was really we are walking to the very fine line of security and uh, quality of results. So I would skip this. This is the one of our uh, platforms, which we need to introduce like on a couple of day basis, do a verification, validation, and compare it. Also, we need to change actually all of our PCR equipment before, because it was like, running out of steam uh, very, very briefly. We need to really uh, to, to change them because they're just dying out uh, to the burden of the, uh, of the uh, tests we, we actually put on them. So let's see, let's see the number of tests we performed. Uh, although we think that in the second wave, uh, we reach uh, a highest point, uh, I'm very sorry that I couldn't show you right now because we are almost at the same level as we were uh, at the beginning of 2021. Uh, we are really going into this fourth wave with uh, very bad propositions because I told you no schools were uh, actually closed and there is no plan that it will be closed. There is a very low vaccination rate in this um, in this population, also in the, I think in the teachers uh, population, that is very low rate. Uh, I think not more than 50%, which itself is bound to escalate in the next weeks even further. So these are two platforms which save us uh, uh, maybe some burden, but uh, actually see uh, hands-on time is uh, the demand is still going up faster that we could uh, do um, that we could do uh, uh, equipment so nevertheless during the epidemic we are still able to do a proper clinical evaluation this was the first one actually published uh, for the cobas uh, platform and this was done between the 48 hours in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. This is all uh, due to my uh, really great co-workers who were able to do this in the demand uh, which we have at the same time. And when we get a new one, actually we really try to, to compare everything according to 
uh, all uh, rules uh, and to share this information to others which may benefit from that. So this would be one of the platforms which would be gladly to use, but unfortunately, uh, there was a, such a huge shortage of the reagent that was almost uh, unusable during the epidemic. If you see now what the, our setup is, uh, we uh, for now could cover a little bit uh, more. We get the second salinity to being the automated, uh, automated uh, setup for processing the samples. But still, uh, I told you for the 4th of March in 2020, when we registered the first samples, uh, we are uh, really doing a lot of steps to, to uh, get the clinicians and all others served with the quality uh, diagnostics. Um, also, what was uh, we, we were phase two was actually to quantify the results, uh, which on the scale as we did it, you can see on the right side, the normalization of a CT according to the sample quality. Uh, so uh, yes, it is important to, to take care that your samples are really well characterized. So uh, also what it happens, which I never believe it could happen in such a quick way, we for years have tried to establish an NGS facility. All the times there was a lot of problems with uh, with the capacity. So on the other hand, I mean, from, from the other side, we don't have enough samples to run it, but now they're really like hot every day. We did it like hundreds and hundreds of uh, sequences producing every, every week. And uh, actually we try to establish an algorithm to rap rapidly characterize uh, new emerging variants and actively monitors their potential impact on the critical countermeasures. So this is how the phylogenetic evolution of SARS-CoV in Slovenia was going. Um, it is uh, more or less uh, similar like the situation in Europe from uh, somewhere in uh, beginning of the beginning of the summer we actually all other uh, variants were displaced with the delta variant and we are looking now for the vaccinated people for reinfections and especially carefully for the cases which we know that they are imported wave so we believe this is uh, something to do with our bad situation also so rapid antigenic detection test was very popular in my view too popular in slovenia they are used around every corner um, it is uh, really a lot of uh, points where things could go wrong. Uh, it's very hard to explain to clinicians and especially of the uh, antigenic test results. So we have a mandatory confirmation of every positive antigenic test by PCR, but still we could not get over 80% of those positive being really confirmed with PCR. So, uh, here, I'm very much reserved to use the antigenic testing to um, um, actually allow a safe, safe uh, working environment in the hospitals or foster came, uh, 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 foster uh, um, home cares. So uh, we actually all the time really would like to see the PCR test in anyone, we call it the low level or low threshold uh, testing. So with the minimal symptoms, uh, without regard of the vaccination status of the person, we believe uh, they need to be tested. Especially now in the view, what we see from the summer on, we are really heading in the normal, let's say, uh, uh, quote mark, uh, the respiratory situation where all other respiratory viruses would absolutely come back. Uh, what we see in the laboratory, it's uh, quite a lot of metapneumovirus, a lot of RSV virus, rhinovirus, adenovirus, 
and this all definitely make a more mess in the diagnosis of this. So for serological diagnostic approach, actually, you know, uh, that is not really important. There are a couple of instances where it's important. This is evaluation with high clinical suspicion when molecular diagnostic testing is negative, then assessment of multisystemic inflammatory syndrome in children, and for conducting serosurveillance studies. So to certain of available evidence supporting the use of serology for your diagnosis of epidemiology was graded as very low to moderate. We didn't go to the direction that serology is enough, positive serology is enough to grant the person's status of uh, one who is actually going through the disease. So this is something what we did uh, as a study, dynamics of specific antibody response. This is for IgA and IgM. We see quite a big drop in this. So, uh, I would not elaborate a lot on this and that IgG is the same. So we know now that uh, actually that we would probably heading, uh, it's already confirmed for the third dose of the vaccine uh, for the older, but it's also not forbidden to be a place to anyone who was vaccinated. Also, so what we see was uh, interesting that there is age dependent humoral response uh, especially in vaccinated person, the older one, which respond much better than uh, actually did the, the younger one. Uh, so we also do some isolation experiments. So we isolated actually all of the uh, variants we actually get hands on. I'm very proud of this because we are also part of the European Viral Archive and there is a lot of interest for our isolates, which we uh, diligently provide to anyone interested. Uh, I'm also really proud that uh, they ask us from companies like Roche or, or Institute Gamalea from Russia to actually be able to secure the isolates for their students. students. Uh, so we also did the naturalization test, uh, which I would not bother you with uh, as much. So we tried to look for a correlation between anti-S antibodies and neutralizing antibodies. Uh, but if you see on the end, uh, only 50% uh, of those uh, on the, uh, which were um, uh, tested for the antibodies, 50% have also have high neutralizing antibodies. And it's clear that actually people being infected with some other variants does not really neutralize well the new Delta variants. Also, we are dealing quite a lot on the breakthrough cases, but what we see actually uh, in terms of the variants which causing breakthrough infections are the, just the ones which are currently circulating in the population. And also there is a, a important how much it takes from the first infection to the second one. So I think there is a lot of work to be done in this area. Also, if you see which uh, vaccine is actually leaking most, uh, this is really, really very biased uh, uh, representation because you can see uh, Combinati was mostly used in Slovenia. So therefore it's no uh, surprise that they are uh, leak uh, a lot and they're leaking for, for all of the, the uh, the, 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 the uh, variants we actually tested. Also, this is uh, something uh, which we did for uh, more on the region where they were tested, uh, but I don't think this is uh, really uh, enough data to get a really good conclusion from that. But what I'm very proud of and what we did, one of the rare countries, uh, uh, in the world, actually, we ran first national prevalence study of COVID-19 in Slovenia, led by our institute. On the end, also, we provide all the financing of this, all the logistics, all the, 
all the uh, planning and execution. So we select 3,000 randomly selected persons from all of the country uh, by the random selection by the Statistical Institute of Slovenia. And they are invited to participate in studies to determine the prevalence of the infection in April 2020, which now we see is probably a little bit too early. So uh, from 3,000 uh, invited, 1,368 accepted to be uh, swapped and at the same time taking the blood sample. So on the end, uh, we run almost 25 thousand kilometers driving through ambulance cars in 84 tours, 2,000 uh, working hours spent in 12 days uh, from 24 to 1st of May in 2020. It was really like a logistical nightmare. On the left is our institute. This was a queue every morning of the equips going to the terrain and uh, working with uh, patients individually. They come to every house and they ask people who confirmed that they would do, uh, do participate. So what we found actually was not really surprising, but was very important. There was low prevalence of active COVID infection uh, uh, and uh, actually was only 0.15% prevalence of active infections by PCR and seroprevalence was actually estimated from 0.88% to 0.91%. And then uh, actually we do a second round after a six month. And uh, what we found actually, uh, what was the strength of the study that patients have been called uh, uh, during the study and ask them for if there was any symptoms or they could call themselves and they are swapped and detected. So uh, actually you can see on the end, the prevalence go up to 4.16%. So this is still a model which our modeling uh, groups are using uh, for how uh, in this part, what uh, they, they actually compare the data of daily detected cases and what this study have uh, been shown to actually uh, be uh, detected. So microbiological diagnostics should be multiplex, versatile and integrated into clinical diagnostics. So we believe that 95 of patients needs to reasonably fast and straightforward uh, in need for uh, this kind of micro microbiological diagnostics to confirm or refute clinical diagnostics. And about 5% they needs additional investigation, confirmation or follow-up diagnostics. There is why there is a need for a national reference laboratories who have inter infrastructure, expert and specific knowledge and capacity in place. So what were the challenges? Challenges was really unprecedented and it takes about storage of reagents, materials and stuff. We actually don't have a place where to work due to this high amount. There is a high volume testing of samples without appropriate automation equipment at the beginning. We are absolutely unprepared by information technology for the universal sample barcoding and logistics and uh, untrained staff for sample collection, lab work and clinical need for quick results. So this is a couple of pictures how it looks. Uh, as I told you, from 1,000, we, we have gone up to 6,000. You can still see uh, names written by hand, and they need to be identified, sorted, and this was an absolute nightmare. This is picture from 20 p.m., uh, and this is coming from like uh, urgent testing, and then you need to get rid of all this for the night processing. And also in the end, it was also again, very big problem. We are manual in many, many places. So you can see this PP, this means repeat the samples. You see the high cities here uh, uh, in the vicinity of very low cities. So we always checked, we repeated separately isolating as those of you who work in the lab could imagine the the burden of the work we did. So thank you again for your attention. 
and I would like to stress once again, laboratories should always be prepared since it's not a question of if, but rather when, and I would also add what. Thank you again, and uh, I'm uh, ready for questions if we have any time.